to you. Good afternoon, and welcome to Water Distance Education. My name is Greg Weaver, and this is ENG 3C, Grade 11 Workplace English. I'd like to welcome everyone sitting across the north today at home, your learning center, or on Bell Express View. To call in, join our class, you can call 1 800 465 7144 or 737 4017 or 2983 if you're in the Sula Coat, Lac Sul, or Deriden area. Let's welcome everyone back today. Everyone's having a good week. This is our third, our second of three classes this week uh, because of the family holiday. And our plan for today is to finish looking at uh, lesson number five. We're going to end up reading uh, chapter six from our novel, To Kill a Mockingbird. Then we're going to do a quick review of everything we looked at in unit one. And we're going to jump right into Unit 2 at the very end of class. Assume we have enough time. If not, we'll start with Unit 2 uh, tomorrow. So, where we, I picked up where we left off yesterday. And we were looking at Key Questions 5 and 6. So, Key Question 5, you had to do some research based on banning certain books. Looking at book banning. Um, it's something very controversial. Um, so we'll say it's needed to protect children. I would say it's free speech and it should be the parent's decision as to what students uh, read and study in school. So we looked at key question five. And this is how do you do some research based on this you had to find three sources and I pointed out three websites in class yesterday that you could use and these three websites were from the American Library Association uh, Band Book Week which are both US sites And we also looked at um, freedomtoread.ca. And that one there is a Canadian site. Now, there is some pretty big differences between Canada and the United States in terms of uh, trying to ban books. There's different laws and there's different... Um, rights and responsibilities between Canada and the U.S. that make it a lot harder to ban books uh, in Canada. So we looked at all of those. And you had to go through and just copy out this handout here and uh, fill it out with, the, with all the information that you can find. Um, you had to make three copies to do for each of your three sources. Then we quickly looked at this, uh, key question six. We'll look at that now, and then we'll um, get into uh, Chapter 6, which we will get finished, and then we'll get started with uh, Unit 2 today. So once you did that research, think about what you read. In your opinion, should this type of censorship be permitted to continue in the lives of people under the age of 16. Respond to this question in a properly formatted opinion paragraph. Now remember that to use your point proof structure. Your proofs can either be specific examples from your past school or life or 
you can use research or examples from the research that you just did. Look at the history of censorship. Now, the purpose of this assignment is to have you develop an opinion on a controversial topic and provide strong, specific evidence to support your opinion. Now, evaluation will be based on the following. A strong statement of opinion. How much evidence is and what's the quality? Is it really well detailed or, or is it not very well detailed? Or do you have no evidence at all? Use a proper paragraph format. Uh, using proper spelling throughout. For a total of 20 marks. So that's what we're looking at. Uh, for uh, key question six. So this is opinion piece. It's your opinion using th at least three facts or proofs to support what you believe and what you say. And that is the end of unit one. We're going to do a quick review after we read chapter six. So we're going to do our course novel. Now, if you have the novel in front of you, uh, you can find that on page 55. Oh, sorry. That's the wrong page there. I'm uh, sorry, page 66. And we're, it's only 10 pages here. It's page 66 to page uh, 76. It's only 10 pages. won't take us that long to read. We'll do a quick review, and then we'll jump right into unit number two. So we'll get to chapter six here, and we'll, and we'll go from there. So, sort of, yes, said our father. When Jem asked him if we could go over and sit by Miss Rachel's fish pool with Dill, as this was his last night in Maycomb. Tell him so long for me, and that we'll see him next summer. We leapt over the low wall that separated Miss Rachel's yard from our driveway. Jem whistled Bob White, and Jem answered in the darkness. Not a breath blowing, said Jem. Look a yonder. He pointed to the east. A gigantic moon was rising behind Miss Mowdy's pecan trees. That makes it seem hotter, he said. Crossing it tonight? asked Jem, not looking up. He was constructing a cigarette from newspaper and string. No, just the night, just the lady. Don't like that thing, Dale. You'll stink up this whole end of the town. There's a lady in the moon in makeup. She sat at a dresser, combing her hair. We're going to miss you, boy, I said. Rick and Barrett go watch Mr. Avery. Mr. Avery boarded across the street from Miss, Mrs. Henry Lafayette DuBose's house. Besides making change in the collection plate every Sunday, Mr. Avery sat on the porch every night until 9 o'clock and sneezed. One evening, we were privileged to witness a performance by him, which seemed to have been his positively last, for he never did it again so long as we watched. Jem and I were leaving Miss Rachel's front steps one night when Dill stopped us. Golly, look at yonder. He pointed across the street. At first, we saw nothing. But Kudzu covered front porch. 
but a closer inspection revealed an arc of water descending from the leaves and splashing in the yellow circle of the street light, some ten feet from source to earth, it seemed to us. Jem said Mr. Avery misfigured. Dale said he must drink a gallon a day, and the ensuring contest to determine relative distances and prospective prowess would have made me feel left out again, as I was untalented in this area. Dill stretched, yawned, and said altogether too casually, I know what, let's go for a walk. He sounded fishy to me. Nobody make him, just went for a walk. Where to, Dill? Dill jerked his head in a suddenly direction. Jen said, okay. When I protested, he said sweetly, you don't have to come along, Angel May. You wouldn't have to go, remember. Jim was not one to dwell on past defeats. It seemed the only message he ever got from Atticus was insight into the art of cross-examination. Scout, we ain't going to do anything. We're just going get, to get going to the street light and back. We strolled silently along the sidewalk, listening to porch swings creaking with the way of the neighborhood listening to the soft night murmurs of the growing people on our street. Occasionally, we heard Miss Stephanie Crawford laugh. Well, said Dill. Okay, said Jim. Why don't you go on home, Scout? What are you going to do? Dill and Jim were simply going to peep into the window with the loose shutter to see if they could get a look at Boo Radley. And if I didn't want to go with them, I could go straight home and keep my fat, flopping mouth shut. That was all. But what in the Sam Holy Hill did you wait till tonight? Because nobody could see him at night. Because Atticus would keep me so deep in a book he couldn't hear the, to the kingdom coming. Because if we read the killed them, they missed school instead of vacation. And because it was easier to see inside a dark house in the dark... Then the daytime. Did I understand? Jim, please! Scout, I'm telling you for the last time, shut your trap or go home. I declare to the Lord, you're getting more like a girl every day. With that, I had no option but to join them. We went through it. We thought it was a better chance to go under the high wire fence at the rear of the rally lot. We stood less chance of being seen. The fence enclosed a large garden and a narrow wooden outhouse. Jim held up the bottom wire and motioned Dill under it. I followed and held up the wire for Jim. It was a tight squeeze for him. Don't make a sound, he whispered. Don't get in a roll of collards, whatever you do. They'll wake the dead. With this thought in mind, I made perhaps one step per minute. I moved faster when I saw Jem Farhead beckoning in the moonlight. We came to the gate that divided the garden from the backyard. Spit on it, whispered Dill as the gate squeaked. You got us in a box, Jem, I muttered. We can't ever get out here so easy. Shh! Spit on, Scout. We spot ourselves dry, and Jeb opened the gate slowly, lifting it aside and resting it on a fence. We were in the backyard. The back of the Radley house was less inviting than the front. A ramshackle porch ran the width of the house. There were two doors and two dark windows between the doors. Instead of a column, a rough two by four supported one end of each each one end of the roof. An old Franklin stove sat in a corner of the porch. 
Above it, a hat rack mirror caught the moon and shone eerily. Our Jan said soft, lifting his foot. Smatter. Chickens, he breathed. That we'd be obliged to dodge the unforeseen from all directions was confirmed when Dale Hevis spelled G O D in a whisper. We crept to the side of the house, along to the window with a hanging shutter. The sill was several inches taller than Jim. Give you a hand up, Mark to Dale. Wait, though. Jim grabbed his left wrist and my right wrist. And I grabbed my left wrist and Jim's right wrist. And we crouched. And Dale sat on our saddle. We raised him, and he caught the windowsill. Hurry, Jim whispered. We can't last much longer. <laughs> Jim punched my shoulder and we lowered him to the ground. What do you see? Nothing. Curtains. There's a teeny light way off somewhere, though. Let's get back away from it. Okay, let's go around the back end. Shh. He went away to the protest. Let's try the back window. Dale, no, I said. Dale stopped and let Jim go ahead. Jim put his foot in the bomb step. The step squeaked. He stood still. Then try his weight by degrees. The step was silent. Jim skipped two steps, put his foot in the porch, and heaved himself onto it, and teetered for a long moment. He regained his balance and dropped to his knees. He crawled to the window, raised his head, and looked in. It was then that I saw the shadow. It was a shadow of a man with a hat on. At first I thought it was a tree, but there was no wind blowing and the tree's trunks never walked. The back porch was bathed in moonlight and the shadow, crisp as toast, moved across the porch to Jim. Dale saw it next. He put his hands to his face. When it crossed Jim, Jim saw it. He put his arms over his head and went rigid. The shadow stopped about a foot beyond Jem. Its arm came out from its side, dropped, and went still. Then it turned and moved back across Jem, walked along the porch, and off to the side of the house, returning as it had come. Jem leapt off the porch and galloped towards us. He flung open the gate, danced me and Dale through, and shoot us between two rows of swishing collards. Halfway through the collards, I tripped. As I tripped, the roar of a shotgun shattered the neighborhood. Dylan jumped, dived in beside me. Jan's breath came and sobs. Fence for the schoolyard. Hurry, scout. Jim held the bottom wire. Dylan and I rolled through and were halfway to shelter the schoolyard solitary oak when we sensed that Jim was not with us. We ran back and found him struggling in the fence, taking his pants off to get loose. He ran to the oak tree in his shorts. Safely behind it, we gave way to numbness, but Jen's mom was racing. We gotta get home, they'll miss us. We ran across the schoolyard, crawled under the fence to the deer's pasture behind our house, climbed our back fence, we are at the back steps before Jim would let us pause to rest. Respiration normal. Three of us strolled as casually could to the front yard. We looked down the street and saw a circle of neighbors at the Radley front gate. We better go down there, said Jim. They'll think it's fine if we don't show up. Mr. Nathan Ray was standing in, inside his gate, a shotgun broken across his arm. Atticus was standing beside Miss Melody and Miss Stephanie Crawford. Miss Rachel and Mr. Avery nearby. None of them saw us come up. We eased him aside Miss Melody, who looked around. Where were you all? Didn't you hear the commotion? What happened? asked Jim. Mr. Radley shot at a Negro in his collared patch. Oh, did he hit him? No, said Miss Stephanie. Shot in the air. Scared him pale, though. Says if anybody sees a white M-word around, that's the one. 
So he's got the other barrel waiting for the next time he hears in that patch. And next time he, he will name high. Be it Dog, Edward, or Jem Finch. Ma'am? That's Jem. I just spoke. Wear your pants, son. Pants, sir? Pants. In his shorts before God and everybody else. I sighed. Uh, Mr. Finch? In the glare of the street light, I could see Dale hatching one. <clears throat> his eyes widened. His fat chair face grew rounder. What is it, Dale? Asked, asked Atticus. Uh, I, I won him from him, he said vaguely. Won them? How? Dale's hand saw the back of his head. He brought it forward and across his forehead. We were playing strip poker up by the, the fish pool, he said. Jim and I relaxed. The neighbors seemed satisfied. They all stiffened. But what was strip poker? We had no chance to find out. Miss Rachel went off like a town, the town fire siren. Do we, Jesus, Dill Harris? Gamble about my fish pool? I'll strip poker you, sir. Atticus saved Dill from immediate dismemberment. Just a minute, Miss Rachel, he said. I've never heard him doing that before. We were all playing cards? Jim Field deals fly with his eyes shut. No, sir. Just with matches. I'd bear my brother. Matches were dangerous, but cards were fatal. Jim? Scout. Sadakis. I don't want to hear of poker in any form again. Go by deals and get your pants, Jim. Settle it yourselves. Don't worry, Dale, said Jam as he traveled the sidewalk. She ain't going to get you. He'll talk her out of it. That was fast thinking, and er, listen, you hear? We stopped her Agra's voice. Not serious. He all go through, Miss Rachel. Dale was comforted by, but Jem and I weren't. There was still a problem of Jem showing up with some pants in the morning. i give you some of mine, said Dale as he came in his Rachel's steps. Jem said he couldn't get him anyway. Get in them anyways, but thanks anyways. We said goodbye, and Dale went inside the house. He don't even remember he was engaged to me. So he ran back and kissed me swiftly in front of Jim. You all right here, he bawled after us. Had Jen's pants been safely on him, we would not have slept much anyways. Every night, sound I heard from my cot in the back porch was magnified threefold. Every scratch of feet on gravel was Boo Radley seeking revenge. If a passing negro was laughing in the night, was Boo Radley loose after us. Insects splashing against the screen were Boo Radley's insane fingers picking the wire to pieces. The charming trees were me malignant, hoovering, and alive. A link between sleep and wakefulness. She heard Jem murmur. Sleep. Little three eyes. Are you crazy? Shh. Agus lights out. In the waning moonlight, I saw Jem swing his feet to the floor. I'm going after him, he said. I said, but you can't. I won't let you. He struggled into his shirt. I got to. You do and I'll wake up Atticus. You do and I'll kill you. Pulled him down beside me in the cot. I tried to reason with him. Mr. Nathan's going to find him in the morning, Jim. He knows you lost him. When he shows him to Atticus, it'll be pretty bad. That's all there is to it. Go back to bed. That's what I know, said Jim. That's why I'm going after him. I began to feel sick. Going back to the place by himself, I remember Miss Stephanie. Mr. Nathan had the other barrel waiting for the next sound he heard. Be it M-word, dog, Jem knew better than not, that barrel than I. I was desperate. Look, it ain't worth it, Jem. A lickin' hurts, but it doesn't last. You'll get your head shut off, Jem. Please. He blew his breath patiently. It, uh, it's like this, skeleton Mother. Atticus ain't ever whipped me since I can't remember. I want to keep it that way. This is a thought. It seemed that Atticus threatened us every other day. I mean, he's never caught you at anything. Maybe so, but I want to keep it that way, Scout. We should have done that, but we should have done that tonight, Scout. It was then, I suppose, that Jim and I first were in a park company. Sometimes I do understand it, but my periods of bewilderment were short-lived. This was beyond me. Please, I pleaded. Can't you think about for a minute? By yourself on that place. Shut up. It's not like he's ever speak to you again or someone. 
I'm gonna wake him up, Jim. I swear I am. Jim grab my pajama collar and rips it tight. Ah, uh, then I'm then I'm going with you. I choked. No, you ain't. You'll just make noise. It was no use. I unlatched the back door and held up while I crept down the steps. It must have been two o'clock. The moon was setting, and the lattice work shadows were fading to fuzzy nothingness. Jim's white shirt tail dipped and bobbed like a small ghost, dancing away to escape the coming morning. A faint breeze stirred and cooled at the sweat running down my sides. He went the back way, through deer's pasture, across the schoolyard, and around to the fence, I thought. Because that's where the way he was heading. It would take longer, but it was not time to worry about. I waited until the store had time to worry, then listened to Mr. Riley's shotgun. Then I heard the back fence squeak. But it was wistful thinking. Then I heard Atticus cough. I held my breath. Sometimes when we made a midnight pilgrimage to the bathroom, did we find him reading? He said he often woke up during the night, checked on us, and read himself back to sleep. I waited for his light to go on. Straining my eyes, I see it flood the hall. It stayed off, and I breathed again. The night crawlers had retired. But ripe china berries drummed on the roof when the wind stirred. And the darkness was desolate with the barking of distant dogs. There he was, returning to me. His white shirt bobbed over the back fence and slowly grew larger. He came up the back steps, latched the door behind him, and sat on his cot. His cot. Wordlessly. He held his pants. He lay down for a while, her was caught trembling. Soon he was still. And I did not hear him stir again. So that's end of chapter six. In the course novel, we just read as far as a page 76. So we have 300 pages left to go. As I said before, the plan is not to read uh, the entire uh, novel. We're going to read as far as page 149. And the rest will be up to you to read. So we'll jump back into uh, Unit 1. I just want to do a quick review of everything we looked at before we start with Unit 2. So, we had six key questions in this unit. And our whole theme, our whole big idea that linked everything together was the idea of discrimination. What is it? Um, what form can it take? And what could be done about it? So we looked at what was a paragraph and we talked about a definition of discrimination as well as looking at how to clearly explain and justify what your opinion is. And that leads into key question one that you can find out on page 13 of unit number one. Say page 13. And that all it was asking you to do was to think about what do you think discrimination is? What is it? And what form it takes, and how does it make a person feel when they are discriminated against? And you had to write a paragraph for 20 marks. And that was the only key question in uh, lesson number one. Most of our lessons only have one key question. The only exception with that is lesson five where there was two. 
So get look at unit or lesson two. We looked at media. We looked at what is a newspaper and what is a basic news article. So a news article is five components: a headline, byline, lead, quotes, and background information. And we looked at a couple of different examples. One, just a, a basic format for one. And another one, looking at discrimination based on sexual orientation. With the article, Lesbian Kiss Cut from BC School Play. And then you had to go through and look at key question number two, which you can find on page 23. Key question two asked you, to think of an occurrence, something that happened once when either you were the victim of discrimination or you witnessed an act of discrimination, either or. And what you wanted to do was write a news article based on what happened. Now, the thing with this key question is this is what you're going to build on in lesson three as well so you cannot make something up if you you have never been discriminated against or seen or heard of something happening to someone else could be a friend a family member a community member then i wanted you to think about what you saw in tv or in movies and I had asked you to write your news article based on and something you saw either in a movie or a TV show. But it, this cannot be made up. It has to come from a movie, TV show, or from a personal experience that you had or that you were told about. And then listen to uh, lesson three. Now, lesson three looked at almost the exact same thing. So here we looked at an editorial. So instead of writing a news article, we looked at writing an editorial. Still looking at, at discrimination and different forms that that discrimination can take. Look at, airdrop, look at banning smoking in public smoke rooms. That has now happened. There is now no more smoking allowed at all inside any build, any um, restaurant or place of work. Well, but you still smoke inside of your own house. So this article was from May 2004. It is uh, 11 years old. And what you wanted to do was read that over and figure out the differences between what is an editorial and what is a news report. Once you had done that, you had to complete key question three. Now there's two parts to key question three. The first part, you had to uh, write an editorial using the exact same uh, discrimination event as you talked about in your news article from lesson two. Um, in terms of that, you had to the exact same incident wherever it was but instead of doing it in the form of a news article better in the form of an editorial so talk about what happened now what can be done to help correct this situation
So the second part, number two, was asking you to think about your opinion. And this says, what did you find easier to write? Was it easier to write the news report or the editorial? Which one did you find it easier to write? And which one did you um, like writing more? This is a 10 mark question. It's looking at what did you think and why did you think that? And that was lesson three. Lesson four, looked at how to write a review. So looked at what's a film review. And then we looked at uh, key question, which was the movie review. So for this, what you had to do was choose any movie that focuses on discrimination as a theme or as a big idea. Uh, in class yesterday, I showed you a whole bunch of different examples of the of possible topics and possible movies. Now, it is perfectly fine to do a movie that you have already seen before. You don't have to recreate them. You can just do it like they're all that you already had done. They've already seen before, but. You had to write a nine paragraph review. So you had an example in lesson four, and you also had um, a organizer here that's on page 36. And this allowed you just to fill in the blanks, look at exactly what's there. Once you have your information down, you want to turn that into sentences and paragraphs. And there's two different parts to this, and that's all clear detail in your lesson. And then we got into uh, lesson five, which we just looked at, started yesterday and finished off today. Looking at feature articles such as um, a extended editorial, um, a researched uh, piece of writing on a controversial topic, such as banning books in schools. So you read this feature piece called "Maybe It's Right to Kill a Mockingbird." You read through that yesterday. It is it was a little difficult to read, but we got through it. We tried to explain it the best that I could, and then we did these these support questions. Now remember. The answers for all of these support questions are available at the back of uh, unit number one. So the suggested answers, now not all of them have suggested answers. Uh, some of them don't, some of them are just there um, because it's asking for your own opinion. So there's no uh, right or wrong answer but you want to go through and uh, try and see these questions make sure you understood exactly what you read and what you had to look at and then we analyzed that and then you looked at key questions five and six we reviewed that earlier in this class key question five you had to find three sources online with regards to banning books or some kind of censorship. Now I showed you three websites yesterday. I showed one from the American Library Association or ALA. I showed you one from Banned Book Week. Both of which were American sites. And I showed you one from Canada called freedom to read.ca. If you missed that, you can always find that on our on our archives on our website. Or if you have, if you find me on Facebook, or look for me on YouTube, um, the classes are all posted on YouTube. So either on YouTube or on our website, they're available. So you had to do this research, and then once that was done, you had to write an opinion. So based on either the research you had and 
your own opinions or ideas. You want to think about, is this kind of censorship or banning books permitted in the lives of people under the age of 16? So do you have to, or should these books be banned for people under the age of 16? Yes or no? Now, there is no right or wrong answer to this question. Instead, I want you to see what do you think, are you for or against it, and what evidence or what proof you use in order to do that. How do you prove that? If you want to think about that, So, and that was what we just looked at for all of Unit 1. So, in addition to Unit 1, we also read through Chapters 1 to 6 of our course novel, To Kill a Mockingbird. So, what happened? A quick plot summary for those six chapters. We were introduced to the main characters. The narrator name is Scout. Her brother is Jem. Her father's name is Atticus. And their last name is Finch. You have Scout, Jem, and Atticus Finch. Their maid or housekeeper's name is Calpurnia. Um, their best friend only comes in the summertime. His name is Dill. And they have neighbors. They have a couple the Radley family. Uh, Henry, they have Mrs. DuBose, Mrs. Lafayette. And those are the neighbors that are around them. We looked at, first looking at what's it like to be a child in uh, southern uh, Alabama in the 1930s. This is set in the early 1930s. So at that time of the Depression, a lot, a millions of people were out of work in Canada and the United States. There wasn't a whole lot of money going on. It was a really hard time to be living in. So just look at different stories of that. So far, we've gone through two years. I'm sorry, we're first introduced to Scout and, and Jem and Dill. The summer before Scout entered grade one. And we just finished reading in chapter six, five and six, sorry about the summer between grade one and grade two. So, so far we've covered two years of time. And we'll see what happens later on with in uh, chapter seven to 11. We are only gonna read as far as the end of chapter 11 or part one. The rest of the novel will be up to you to read. So please, if you want to, try and read ahead of the novel to see what you can come up with and see how far you can get and make sure you understand what we're looking at. Um, we didn't get to Unit 2. We'll start Unit 2 tomorrow. Like everyone who joined me and called in, any questions, uh, give me a call or send me a Facebook message, email me. Um, other than that, I'll talk to everyone again at the exact same time tomorrow. Until then, miigwetch and have a good night.